Okay, hey guys, uh, welcome to another session of our Futurist series where we chat to tech entrepreneurs uh, and they just share their thoughts with us on who they are, what they're about, and what their thoughts are on this world that we're navigating uh, right about now. So today we have Adam Duxbury. Uh, Adam, maybe you can give a brief intro for everybody who's watching. Hey, Sha, lovely to be here. Uh, yeah, so brief intro, background to myself. Um, I started my career as a management consultant um, straight from university. And from there, after about a year and a half of, of working, I started up Grand Dilla Swim, which was you know, meant to be a passion project on the side. We want to be at the beginning of this online growth acceleration that would inevitably be happening in South Africa. And I think we overshot the mark by about six years because that only happened in, in March of this year alongside the global pandemic. But, but nonetheless, um, the business was intended to be just uh, uh, an online store, but we quite quickly realized that retail was a very important component to fashion and fashion retail in South Africa. People want to try before they buy. And so we opened up a couple of stores around the country and, and we've actually ended up having, you know, quite a sizable wholesale and retail business relative to our quite small online store. Um, and so that's kind of the ground of the swim story. Then after a couple of years, uh, you know, management consulting and, and Grand Dilla Swim at the same time, I decided to go back to Grand Dilla Swim full time and spent a couple of years on the business there and, and started a, a few other ventures, one of which is an event space in Cape Town called Rooftop on Bree. Another one is a kombucha manufacturing plant, um, which is based in, in Cape Town in Salt River. And it's important to remember that we have this kombucha warehouse, like a food manufacturing facility. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then last year, um, early on in, in 2019, I was offered to join Yoko Technologies as, as chief of staff. And initially I was you know, a bit unsure of it, to be honest, because I had a number of other businesses on the go and I was quite happy being able to travel and work in my own time, in my own time zone and time calendar and routine. And uh, working at a, at a company again was going to be a bit of a change for, for someone who was very comfortably an entrepreneur. But that being said, the more time I spent with the Yoko team and, and the more I thought about it, I realized this was really a ticket to learn and, and grow. And so I joined last year in November. And so it's almost been a year anniversary that, that, that I've been at Yoko and I have absolutely zero regrets. It's been eye opening and challenging and fantastic for me. Mm -hmm. um, most recently at the beginning of lockdown, um, we, we obviously, you know, recognized as a, as a team that, and I'm speaking now on my entrepreneurial teams rather than the Yoko team specifically, we recognized that this was going to be a weird couple of months, whatever that meant at the beginning of March. The immediate impact was that our retail outlet that we had at the Urania 6 Farmers Market, where we were trading kombucha on the weekends, was, was going to be shut down at least for a couple of months. And, and what I kind of clicked in my mind was that all these other retailers that are doing this weekend kind of mission to, to sell, whether it's pancakes or, you know, um, uh, shakshuka or mushrooms, these guys wouldn't have any revenue or trade for the next couple of months while, while this pandemic was, was being, uh, was impacting us. So the idea was born to be an online platform for small businesses to be able to deliver and get their produce to customers. And this was the origin of Granadilla Eats. So we started this business very quickly with real MVP style. We launched with just veggie boxes. That was it. That was all you could buy a pre allocated box of vegetables mm -hmm. for I think 199 Rand. And we started delivering the first boxes within 48 hours. And the reason that was possible is because we had the assets required to do this. We had a team, which was the Granadilla Swim team. We had a food processing warehouse and factory with cold storage and a big, you know, kind of refrigerated container mm -hmm. and a team that was used to dealing with food and food products in, in the, you know, the benefit of having this kombucha factory, which has now been entirely converted into, into a Granadilla Eats warehouse. Oh. Um, so we were very fortunate actually to kind of have the right puzzle pieces and then, you know, again, fortunate to be able to see how these things could come together and very quickly build up what, um, what has become 
quite a lockdown like uh, passion story. And I think it's, it's, we've done a lot of fantastic things. We've connected a lot of small businesses with consumers that otherwise wouldn't have. Um, we've got a wonderful story about a farm based in Philippi. It's a community farm that had thousands of heads of lettuce that were due to kind of expire because the restaurants all canceled their orders. Mm -hmm. And we were tagged in a post on Facebook, which was basically a plea from the farmer saying, Hey, you know, does anyone know someone that could buy these lettuce heads? And, and we've now become, you know, uh, distributors for this farm. They're one of our major suppliers. And yeah, so there's just been some wonderful stories along the way. And, and of course, this, this Granadilla Eats business was born out of all of this. So that kind of brings us to, to today yeah. um, in a nutshell. Awesome. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and I think that um, save for the, the existing key or puzzle pieces that you have, which is the supply chain and, and, and the warehouse elements, I think tech uh, unlocked a lot of the uh, abilities of your, uh, yourself to pivot from Granadilla uh, somewhere to, to Granadilla Eats. Uh, and, and I'd love to deep dive into, into that a little bit more. I think let's just take a step back, right? So you, you created this online platform, uh, Granadilla, uh, somewhere, and you're very much involved now in, in, in FinTech, in, in, in what's a major player in the South African tech space, right? Um, I would, I would say that, that you, you're definitely a tech uh, enthusiast as, as much as anybody can say uh, and, and you've brought that change from, from a, the retail environment so taking a step back let, let's look at your, your previous education uh, and, and how the decisions that you made led you to, to where you are to use tech in the way that you have cool yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question um, I have quite a diverse education and, and I mean as you may have noticed from the various companies and jobs that I've held pretty diverse experience, which, which means that I've become somewhat of an expert generalist in things. Mm -hmm. And so I think my education mirrors that as well. Um, when I left school, I was definitely going to be a lawyer. That was 100% what I was going to be. I went to UCT, I studied a business science, economics and law degree. And after about four years, I decided I was definitely not going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so I completed my degree with my economics honors. I had done some enough law to have a bit of an understanding of what that career would mean and, and decided not to, to pursue it any further. And the consulting company that I went to work for basically specialized in, uh, in TMD, which is, you know, tech media and digital or, or tech media and, and telecoms. And so the majority of the clients that we, that we had were, were telcos, um, also telcos that wanted to do kind of a digital transformation, mm -hmm. had a very interesting project in Indonesia for a, a company called Telcom, not any relation to the South African Telcom. Mm -hmm. um, they are the, the largest kind of fixed line operator as well as mobile operator. I think they have 150 or 180 million subscribers on Telcom Cell, which is the, the mobile network, one of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. And the project that we were doing for these guys was effectively a digital transformation where they wanted to, you know, use all of these aspects of, of and create a kind of a tech ecosystem for their uh, consumers. So this was things from a mobile wallet to video on demand that you could basically right. access through your, you know, Telcom Cell app. Um, gaming and it was this whole portfolio of initiatives that they that they wanted to do and one of the one of the puzzle pieces that I got most stuck into was uh, was the fintech component okay. right and so this was kind of where the idea of, of fintech for me at least began and we were you know facing all kinds of challenges right um, Indonesia is a cash-based environment there's tons of cash usage and unlike South Africa you don't really have the safety component um, you're not super nervous or concerned about carrying cash on you. But you do also have these, these great features of the demographic, which is that you have a very youthful and very tech savvy consumer. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like, cool, there must be some potential here. Um, they are completely underbanked. There's very low credit card penetration, at least relative to South Africa, where we have, you know, 80% card penetration, which is, which is very high. And, um, yeah, so eventually, uh, when when I when I then kind of came around to spending a bit more time 
um, post consulting, I had a bit of free time and I decided to do a, an, an online course in FinTech, which I would highly recommend. It was through Get Smarter, which is a South African right. company that was bought by 2U. And, um, and it, was a, it was a fantastic, uh, you know, deep dive three month course into financial technology at, at a kind of a global level. And, and this was very much um, one of the most exciting and like kind of rewarding educational experiences that I've had that really deepened my interest and passion into the industry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a background. Um, I also then did do a CFA, which, which is kind of to cover some of the financial aspects that I, that I didn't have covered through an economics major. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that kind of summarized it. Very cool, man. So, so just specifically when, within the fintech space, and, and that's such a, it's such an emerging space at the moment. I think, you know, one could look at card penetration and be like, when we compare ourselves to in, in Indonesia, but I think the lack of card penetration and the rise of the smartphone actually allows for more innovation in terms of transferring of money and, and, and fiscal solutions, uh, specifically for, for like uh, smaller economies, which, I mean, if, if, if you see what's happening in, in Kenya, Uganda, uh, for example. So, so it's interesting one and, and it's so dynamic and I guess that makes it, makes it even more interesting, I guess. Um, let's fast forward a little bit and, and, and keeping with the, with, the t with the theme of, of tech, Incorporating that into Granadilla, maybe you can give us an idea of, of how tech involves itself in, in your guys' current operation. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, you know, with Granadilla Swim, it's, uh, you know, the majority of the tech is, is kind of in the website, right? And, and, I can, and I can make an interesting observation here, which was um, something that, that, uh, that, that is worth knowing for someone who's not a developer themselves, right? But is interested in, in using technology to grow their business. So when we started Grand La Swim, our first website ever, we wanted to go like super light on budget, right? And so we spent about 15,000 Rand to build a website with the, with the local developer. Uh -huh. That was it, right? You know, we made 10 to 15,000 Rand to build a fully functional website and, and to get trading. Um, so a very kind of reasonable way of getting in. And this was like seven, eight years ago when I think building with Wix and kind of building your own site wasn't as practical. It was possible, but it, you probably couldn't do quite what you wanted to. Cool. So, so that was a kind of the, the, the origin, right? And then about a year later, we decided, cool, let's upgrade this website. And instead of going to level two, we just went straight to level 10. And we found a developer that, that was using Magento as a, you know, kind of the web platform and made the mistake, I now believe, of investing in a website that cost us about 125 grand, totally like overspecced for what we needed. We built a whole bunch of fancy features like international IP tracking so that if you landed on, the, on a page from a different country, you'd get your own currency and you wouldn't just get a converted RAND price which came out as like $62.73, it would be $64.99, exactly what we wanted. And we built a whole bunch of these really complex features and had a backend that we had absolutely no idea how to manage, became completely reliant on our um, external yeah. development agency uh, to make even the tiniest little bit of changes. And we just accepted that. That was how we were gonna like run this business. And we, you know, I think, one of the interesting and cool things that we managed to do, which, which I was grateful for our web development team, the, the, the agency that we worked with, was um, to do an integration with the courier company, mm -hmm. uh, which was Dawnwing. So effectively, the, um, they had an API that, that meant that Dawnwing would, we had a Dawnwing physical printer in the office and you could kind of call the, the customer information from, from our website and, and populate the, the wables so that that simplified the distribution that was, you know, a great thing that that we managed to do but aside from that you know we were pretty much stuck with this really complex clunky back end that, that we had very minimal control over yeah and when we launched granadilla eats we decided to do it on a shopify platform which totally changed the game very accessible very simple and um yeah we we just you know things kind of changed overnight in terms of our ability to, to engage with what was happening on the website, to use applications or at least web apps to, to do a whole bunch of cool features that previously we were, we were at the beck and call of, a, of an agency. Um, 
interestingly, again, with, with the courier side of things, which is where tech is, has, played a, has played a very important role, is uh, we utilize uh, route mapping software that is um, pretty much uh, JungleWorks is the, is the kind of international platform that, that has built, the, that has built the, uh, the program. And effectively, what we can do is, is input a number of routes or at least locations that the driver needs to deliver in a specific day. And it then plots a, plots a route that the driver will receive on their side and, and basically get, you know, effectively a Google Maps looking UI that the, that the driver can follow and, and tick off deliveries as they go which gives us a lot of control over our deliveries through the course of the day and, and also means that we don't need to outsource our distribution and so that we have kind of full control over communication with the customer, what the SMSs look like. We also integrate it with WhatsApp so that the customers will get a WhatsApp ping when you know, your driver's five minutes away. They also get a little link that gives them the option to track the customer and so there's, there's a lot of great features in, in that that have been um, unlocked for for uh, for us to manage as well as for the customer. This is great. And, and I think you gave us a really great detailed description of how entrenched uh, Granadella is in, in tech. I have a couple of questions. Now that yeah. you moved over to Shopify, did you realize a lot of the build on your website is a sunk cost? You mean on the old website? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the old website, I mean, Granadilla Swim and Granadilla Eats have two different websites, and we actually are in the process of migrating Granadilla Swim over to a Shopify site. Sure. And yeah, I mean, again, I'm not quite sure that Shopify was the right choice between Shopify and WordPress. Again, there are some limitations with Shopify, specifically in the payment checkout. Yeah, yeah. You have very little control over the wording and the phrasing. So, for example, we use PayFast as our payment gateway. And on checkout, it says PayFast with their logo. It doesn't actually say debit or credit card, mm -hmm. right? Super frustrating. I think that if you pay for Shopify Plus, which is, I'll probably get this number wrong, but a couple thousand dollars a month, um, once you pay for that, then you can unlock some kind of edit, edit authorizations within the payment flow. But otherwise, you're pretty limited there. Um, and there's a few little things here and there that, you, you know, when you're building the site, you actually don't imagine those. But then once you need to do them, you're like, yeah, yeah. that is really a pain. Yeah, w without going into too much detail of, of how we all create technical debt for ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, let's, I just want to understand, at what point did you pivot between having an outsourced uh, dev agency versus probably having internal guys? And, and what was the rationale behind that decision? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think at the moment we do, a, we have a bit of a hybrid, right? So we, we have, we have some kind of development skills in house Shopify is, you know, relatively manageable and, and, you know, for the most part we can do it. And I think what, what it was more of a natural evolution where we just had some people in the team that started to develop the skill. Mm -hmm. And because it was a relatively accessible platform, there's a bunch of great tools you can learn online. And, and I think that in general, what we've kind of wanted to do here is, you know, use an agency sparingly, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'll use the example maybe, maybe of, uh, of running Google ads, right? This is something that, you know, is perhaps sometimes fall within a, within a growth performance team, but also it can maybe fall on like a CTO type role in a company because... Right can get a little bit technical, especially in a startup, at least, you know, typically at a company at scale, this is, this is not where the CTO sits, but it's an example of something that, that can get a bit technical. You want to kind of, you know, have a bit of a technical mindset mm -hmm. and it, the same would go for, you know, building your, your, your own site or, or having your own like portal dashboard for clients. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a merchant based company like Yoko is, and I guess the concept is that, once you have an agency, as long as you're not becoming dependent on them, and as long as you're starting to develop certain of the skills in-house and learning from them as you go, mm. I think it's great to utilize them at the outset. Um, but the risk is that you become dependent and that you don't actually own the relationship or understand enough that, that you're in control. And, and I think that that's what we tried to do the second time around was to say, hey, if we're going to use an external, you know, search engine, um, you know, optimization agency, or if we're going to use someone to 
help us out with our Google ads or if we're going to use a, you know, a local company that's going to basically do like a managed service for our courier and distribution, let's make sure we have a really close relationship with them that we're learning a lot. And over time we can start taking more and more of this in house. And, and that's kind of what we've done a little bit better this time around. Such valuable insights, man. I mean, uh, just, just being able to, to, have you described that that progression and and uh i think what you mentioned is to be able to build that relationship and take learnings because there's other ways in which you can create value for your business with those kind of relationships other than the actual managed service itself so yeah. awesome let's um let, let's chat about sourcing these guys i mean uh, as you progress and you you sort of uh, emancipate yourself from these outsourced services how do you go about sourcing good technical talent and understanding the stage you're at to identify what sort of technical talent you need. If you could probably give me examples from both Granadilla and Yoko, I think anyone would be, would be really valuable. Yeah, no, this is, this is very interesting. Um, there are a lot of ways to source tech talent and depending on the, on the, the role level that you want to hire, there are many different ways. And, and this, I really like this question because when you start asking me about the technical platforms and the back end, this when I start getting a little bit shaky, but recruiting of devs is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. It's a challenging one. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll start off with, you know, I'll go through the different ways and rather than for these specific use cases, because it varies quite a lot. One of the like really common popular platforms in South Africa is offers in it's a, it's a very useful resource. Um, it's, it's great for filling out a dev team but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for finding a tech leader or for someone like a CTO kind of role in a startup. There is something kind of interesting about, there's like a, re, a reverse hiring process when you use offers in, which was a, a bit unexpected, which effectively means that you as the company have to sell yourself to the developer rather than the developer making their case to you. Mm. And this can create a bit of an awkward complex where the developer is a bit put on a pedestal in this hiring relationship, yeah. um, which is an interesting situation to find yourself in when you're used to hiring being quite the other way around. So I do think that, that they offer some fantastic quality candidates. If I'm not mistaken, their flat fee is about 12 and a half percent on the annual cost to the company. So, and you also have a three month money back guarantee baked in there. So overall, I think it's a fantastic resource for, for filling out a dev team. Mm -hmm. Then you've got direct outreach, right? So like going on LinkedIn and, and having a look for people, this is something that we've had relatively less success with. If you've got a great brand name and when I say we, um, this is a complicated we because I'm speaking across companies, but yeah. from a Yoko perspective, you've got a great brand behind you. That's a lot, it's a lot different to if you're, if you're a startup that's relatively unknown. The reality is that uh, developers are not going on to LinkedIn to look for their jobs, at least from my experience, right? They, they, uh, this is just not where they're hanging out. They know that they're in high demand and, and unless they're getting something from a really important company or unless they're getting something from a specialized recruiter, like a cloud stream or a tomato or something like that, these guys do the head hunting. And we've also had great success with some companies that I do some advisory work for, but also, um, at Yoko with, with, uh, you know, specialized recruiters. Typically, this is going to be for a lead, really important role. You, you get a dedicated recruiter, you build a good relationship with them, and, and they effectively can plug into their network of tech talent that you wouldn't know about, right? These people are not actively looking for work, and this is the, a big difference between an offer zen and using a specialized recruiter, is that they'll pick up people that they know are interested in something, but they're not actually active putting their word out anywhere, and, and so you can get some really high quality uh, candidates from, from this particular approach. And, and I'd say that it's, you know, one of the challenges is you'll kind of get locked into, usually they only like to be working with one of you at a time, or at yep. least you, you should only work with one recruiter at a time. Um, so that's just something to consider. You want to choose, you know, the right, the right recruiter. Um, then there's some amazing companies like uh, We Think Code, 
the fantastic story um, at Yoko. We have a couple of interns from from We Think Code that you know some of them then go back to study, others of them move move on to other companies, and others of them actually stay. So it's effectively a coding agency based in Cape Town. It's kind of like a university, but specifically for for developers. Um, they yeah. also have a very diverse pool of candidates. Uh, a lot of women in tech, which is very very important. Mm -hmm. I think that this is something underestimated the importance of a diverse team not only are you solving problems but it's a bit like a flywheel you know once you start hiring a more diverse team your team gets better that you're able to hire more diverse people yeah. because you know it's difficult when you're the only person of color or the only female in a development team yeah um i heard or at least in any team but but specifically in tech this is becoming i think more important and the way this was described, sorry for going on a bit of a tangent here, but I think it's very important. Very important. Someone chatted to me about this the other day, which, which was actually our VP of product at Joko. And she basically described it as, you know, being the only, uh, the only female, or the only person of color, or the only person that's queer or disabled in a team is a bit like being in an office where everything is designed for tall people and you're just a short person. It's not that you can't do things, but you need to get a ladder. You need to step up to something. You need to reach. You need to ask for help to get to something. It's just, it's just not an optimal environment. And, and I thought that kind of resonated with me, like being a, you know, a privileged white male living in South Africa. It's, it's, it's not obvious, these mm -hmm. things, but, but it is so critically important and something that we're being very intentional about you know, across the businesses I'm involved in. So yes, we think code, we've actually found some great um, developers from there as well. And the last platform maybe worth mentioning is a company in Johannesburg called Amuzi, founded by a good friend of mine called Gilbert Pooley. And basically these guys, they take candidates that go and, you know, pre-COVID at least would, would stay at the campus um, in Johannesburg. And the way that their model works is that a business will effectively hire for the future mm -hmm. and they will pay for a candidate to go through the platform, to go through the program, mm -hmm. which can be a one year program. And they do kind of a bunch of, you know, I think pretty much full stack kind of courses and offer them, offer the uh, corporates the opportunity then to hire the candidate at the end of their um, course that they've done and Amuzi kind of trains them up to to be ready for you know hitting the hitting the hitting the ground running um, so yes these are some of the, the the processes at least that we've gone through that yeah. I can think of to to recruit devs it's a it's a tricky one but a, a very important one to get right and invest in I think you, you're absolutely right there's different channels and I think the way that you broke it down whether you realize it or not is um, you, I think you started off, if you want to recruit intermediate developers, that's where you go to your office in. If you want to recruit your exec executives, you probably go your, your direct uh, recruiting method. And, and, and probably for your junior developers, you probably look at in, uh, individual uh, companies and, and career accelerators like We Think Code, Umuzi, and us as well. We obviously have career services. So we're getting that, some, we're getting that exact same feedback from uh, individuals like you. I think that because of your experience, you also recognize the value, not only in terms of uh, a demogra the demographically diverse team. Was that Shabnam who said that, by the way? No, it wasn't Shabnam. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, the VP of product is a lady by the name of Lindsay Keithley. Right, She's right, okay. Product at Monzo, fantastic um, colleague, yes. But okay. no, not Shabnam, but, but <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, and then, uh, with regards to, to recruiting uh, junior developers, as I said, some of the companies that are out there, these career accelerators, ourselves, we think code, Muzi, all very different structures uh, with different uh, placement rates, uh, different student intake numbers. What I was saying is, is as an individual who has more experience, uh, let's just say in tech recruiting uh, and in solving the problems that companies experience in these ages, um, a lot of companies don't really know how to balance their team in terms of diversity of skill sets, how to create a portfolio of a dev team where you can have your junior developers, where you can have your intermediates, even I mean, if that's even a thing, right? And then your, your, your senior developers, your mentors and your, and your CTOs. So 
what would be a, what would be the advice you'd give to, to some of the business out there that are looking towards digital transformation but have this very stringent criteria of you need a com sci degree uh, and that would allege you to be a candidate, but then at the same time, create that dynamic where the supply is uh, less than the demand, which puts the developers on a pedestal, right? Uh, where you have this access to talent, but you aren't looking at it because of your uh, recruitment processes. I mean, any advice there? Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I guess, you know, one way of thinking about this, maybe two observations. The one is like, these, these tech teams, right, which, which I guess get called squads, product teams, pods, whatever, um, you know, this is something that is, we're starting to see at Yoko more and more as our unit of constraint, right? Like we cannot take on more work than we have good teams for. And good teams are complete teams. Complete teams, in most cases, of course, there are exceptions. You need a product manager, developers, and that needs to include a tech lead, you need a designer in there um, and then potentially someone who's going to be helping out with data at the, at the least, right? Um, if you want to throw in a researcher in there, you know, potentially part-time or a growth or performance or product marketer, also potentially part-time. But thinking about that, that as a holistic team that is capable of autonomously delivering value to customers quickly, and whether they're using Scrum or whatever else, you know, it, that's, that's less important. But that team needs to be complete and needs to have a clear vision and clear goals. And, and the skill diversity within that team is, is just absolutely critical. And I think, you know, so that, that's, that's the one way I think about it is that those are really the teams that you want to build around and you don't want to have, you know, too many developers without a designer or without a product manager, because, you know, you need to have that balance right in terms of the skills. So another interesting observation is the fact that you have this career path for developers, which is sometimes less or, or better formed. It's something we're thinking about quite a lot. So there's, there is a difference between a design lead or a tech lead and a tech principal or a design principal. And the principal concept, I guess what I'm trying to distinguish here is someone who doesn't necessarily want to manage people and that that isn't necessarily the natural progression for someone who's a senior developer. And so you may go from being a senior developer to wanting to actually be you know, someone who manages teams, someone who becomes more involved in the people aspect, but you may also want to be someone who is just able to crush some like incredibly complex coding challenges. And you may be really, really smart, really, really switched on, but people management and the, you know, recruitment and um, this kind of stuff is actually not your forte and that's got to be okay. So that career path within your team and within your organization needs to be available to people. Otherwise, you know, they're going to leave the company if they feel like it's not somewhere clear that they can elevate themselves to. So it's something that I've noticed to be a gap is that the, the principal role is something that isn't always fully clear and formed so that you have, you know, people that don't feel like they have a clear way to progress. And, you know, a, a development principal can be very much on the same kind of pay grade as like a director or, a, you know, um, even a VP of, of kind of engineering or something like that. There's no reason that the person can't be on a similar pay level you know, as, as that. That's obviously a factor. So not sure if that answers your question, but, but there are a couple of thoughts on that. OK, no, that's fair. Um, I'm going to flip it around because I originally asked you if, if, for your advice on, on, on businesses and, and how they could better the way in which they uh, structure their, their dev teams and, and also source them. But let's, let's also just flip it around. And, and as somebody who is looking for, for talent, uh, what would be your advice to individuals who are obviously trying to get employed uh, and looking at the huge employment, unemployment gap that we have and specifically the gap within tech? That, uh, that's created. So, so what would be your advice to, to, to individuals who are looking to get into that um, market and as somebody who is recruiting for those skill sets, what would it be that you're looking for? So advice to the, to the candidates, so developers out there looking for work. W wannabe developers, students, uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, this is kind of generic advice for, for almost anyone looking for a specific job. The most important thing is that you, 
you're finding something that you're passionate about here. Um, the way that I really see this, this change for me, and this happened the day that I left my consulting job. It was the day that I did not have the week, at least that I did not have Sunday blues, mm -hmm. that bum out feeling on a Sunday afternoon when you're like, shit, I have work tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. you have that, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Right. And I haven't had that since then. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's kind of like, it's a nice natural way that at least I've found a bar of like, yes, I'm doing the right thing or no, I'm not. And I had that throughout university. I dreaded Mondays. I have to be honest. <laughs> and, and I had that throughout school and I had that throughout my consulting gig. I, I, you know, I enjoyed my job, but, but that's kind of the feeling. So if you feel like on Sunday, you're going to be stoked for what you're doing next, or if you don't feel like that now, then, then I would consider something, something different. Um, otherwise I think, uh, you know, looking for work right now as a, as a developer is, is probably not the hardest thing. You probably will be able to actually find a company that, that interests you. And, and I would encourage people to support local companies and to not be sucked into a salary that is, necessarily going to be the the key decision factor of course that's important mm -hmm. negotiate what's fair for you make sure that that you know you're getting what you deserve but at the same time in, invest in your future and me personally I've, I've made a lot of decisions and, and right now i mean i'm actually in in europe and you know earning a south african salary from south african companies and of course when i go out and we and I'm chatting to friends about the Euro South Africa exchange rate, which yeah. has improved a little, but yeah, yeah. but nevertheless, they're like, well, why don't you get a job locally? And I'm, you know, I'm I'm really proud to be able to be part of the South African ecosystem, to be able to support South Africa and to learn um, from from the fantastic companies that we have there. So, yeah, I would also encourage uh, South Africans to continue to support South African companies and make sure that their skills are. are being used on something impactful i you know we we in a lot of interviews we hear about uh people wanting to be part of something that's making an impact and something that's making a difference and part of a company that has an awesome culture you're also an ex yoko you, you know about it it feels good to work for for something that's kind of bigger than yourself mm -hmm. and and so i'd really encourage that layer of thinking onto onto this when you when you make a decision about where you want to work yeah, agreed, and and it's it's been something that that's coming up that that has come up, and I think as we, well, when I say we, I'm I'm referring to the the quintessential millennial out here, but uh, right. as as we grow up, we we see these issues that we need to solve and 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 um, initiatives that we want to work on to try and improve. Uh, similarly, with with Hyperion Dev and and being able to to teach people how to code, to be able to bring forth that that. Uh, I wouldn't say revolution, but I would say the next phase in, in, in the way that we think and work and interact with each other. Uh, I think that's, that's just something that, that resonates, right? So being able to find those problems and being able to find those solutions uh, and work towards the solutions, I think, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I'm 100% behind what you just said. Cool. Well, uh, Adam, thank you so much for your time, man. I, I, I feel like I've picked your brain a lot and you've given us some really valuable gems out there. So, yeah, thank you so much and I really appreciate it. No, absolutely. Shimo, it was really a pleasure to meet you and, and to get a chance to chat to you. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So, thank you. Awesome, man. Well, I hope to see you soon. And, uh, yeah, maybe when you're back in SA, we can... You're in Vienna at the moment, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And he, well, you can't really come back now, can you? Is, is I, I actually did just come back. I just I did a quick two week trip to back to SA okay. for um, some uh, some workshops that we had, which which just made more sense to do in person. And I just arrived back over the over the weekend. I did an overnight flight um, because of I guess I just keep jumping between the countries, saying like, oh yes, I need to go home to South Africa and show my South African passport. Oh, I need to go to Europe and I. I also have a, a European passport so you know I can actually jump between regardless of the of the lockdown situation okay 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 well all the best gents and uh, yeah take it easy thank you so much again thanks very much Jim have a lovely day cheers man bye